folks, Captain Mike here from Hoagie Lure Company. Today I just wanted to quickly debrief back of the dock after a film shoot we did with Salty Cape TV. Well, this is a classic situation of when in Rome. Uh, well, we headed out in search of a jig and pop film shoot. Well, Mother Nature had other plans for us. Well, the good news was uh, getting on scene, we quickly discovered there were fish in the area, but they were scattered and they wanted bars. So if they want bars, we'll give them bars. And uh, it's amazing what just four, four properly rigged spreader bars behind the boat can do. And uh, this was a, a fun day, lots of multiple hookups, and also a textbook example of a no outrigger center console spread I have in my light tackle offshore playbook. Now my spread fits in this very compact bag. This is our uh, classic no outrigger spread bag. And uh, this, this spreader bar collection is pretty much all you need for a day like today. Uh, we've got two directional bars, a, a port bar and a starboard bar that'll track way out and create a you know traditional spread without the outriggers. Then you have the two classic bars that'll shoot right down the middle. Now it's amazing what four rods can do out there carefully placed in a W formation behind the boat. Uh, with just four rods you're extremely nimble. It's easy to stay on top of weed checks. It's easy to just keep a nice clean spread. Now one option might be to send a rod down the middle but today I'm happy with just four rods and they're doing the trick. So talking about trolling patterns here, you can overthink it, but I do like having some semblance of an organized trolling pattern where I work sort of a spiralized grid outward from my starting point. And by trolling north, east, south, and west in different cadences throughout the spread, uh, A, I'm gonna have an efficient search pattern, but B, sometimes tuna-like, uh, the bars or any trolling lure for that matter they like sometimes they want it into this into the into the seas or down seas into the sun away from the sun so by doing this organized spiralized trolling pattern you're hedging all your bets both in geographic coverage and in presentation directionally speaking relative to the sea conditions and light conditions now i have an important tip here you'll want to let your directional bars out first and they will swim out of your way. Then you slide the two classic bars right down the middle and they'll just stay away from each other. How far out? Well, it depends. Uh, there's a few things I look at. One is sea conditions. If it's calm like it was today, um, you can let these bars out pretty, pretty far. Now, the further you let the directional bars out, the wider they're gonna swim and uh, so you don't want to let the bars out too far where you're a menace to other boats. But I, what my rule of thumb, a lot of folks will talk about how many feet or what wave in the wake. I just keep letting everything out and tweaking everything till I'm happy with the spread. But the one thing for sure is I like to have very different directions to create that W pattern. So if fish comes into the spread from almost any angle, you have something to offer them. I consider to be more important than the trolling pattern is watching the tells. So obviously birds working and fish crazy, fish crashing, you know, that is what it is. But today the tells were a little more nuanced. And so what we, what we were looking for are sitting birds that are reluctant to move. Usually that means they know something's under them and they don't want to give up that position. Number two, we're looking at the side scan. We're looking for bait balls on either side of us that might impact a little turn to the port or turn to the starboard. Um, you know, and certainly watching the fish finder for actual fish. And so sometimes tells are more pronounced, vortexing birds, and sometimes they're more subtle like they are today. And again, to recap, we're looking for bait balls to troll around and we're looking for sitting birds. Now teasing and weeding were 
important today. Now, I wouldn't say the water was super dirty, but it was weedy, and that's our gas weed that we get that washes in from the Gulf Stream is amazingly sticky in terms of catching on baits. So what we discovered today was surging the baits and drop, so the crank and drop, crank and drop, crank and drop, served two functions. One, it was shedding the weeds by bringing the bars in and back so that forward drop, forward drop would shed the weeds. I think particularly when you're letting it back out. And number two, it was greasy calm conditions. And sometimes I imagine, you know, a school of fish following the bar, sort of checking them out, having one surge and then drop might create that FOMO, that fear of missing out strike. And so the combination of, you know, de-weeding the bars and creating that FOMO reaction strike really upped our game and triggered more than one multiple hookup. Oh, oh, got a fish on. There we go, fish on. When we hook up, I do two things. One, if no one's at the rods, I will surge the boat. I will accelerate oh, the boat to push the go. entire fish spread on. away from the fish that's hooked up, probably swimming in the opposite direction. Again, going after that FOMO strike. And um, also, if um, there's anglers on the boat, I'll have them crank and you know tease. But in terms of like fighting the fish after hooking up, I'll bring in any close rods first and I'll keep the boat in idle to keep a nice tight line on the fish. Remember, the, the, the hoagie bird bars float. And so as long as you're mate watching your lines behind the boat, these they'll be floating out and sort of out of the way. So I only take in what I need to, and it's amazing how many bars get hit just floating there. So use a little common sense when uh, fighting a fish after hookup. Keep the boat you know, in gear to keep lines tight and direction behind the boat. Certainly, um, uh, take in any rod that's in your way because you do not want to get your lines tangled in your engines. Okay, real quick, we're going to talk about landing to keep a fish. So um, when you get the fish boat side, oftentimes out there, yeah, there's a fair amount of drift. You want to land your fish on the upwind side so you don't accidentally drift over the fish. Not only can you lose the fish, but you can get you know, lines tangled in your you know, running gear, whether it's outboards or inboards on a boat. So you want to land the fish on the upward side of the boat, and you want to take the time to get a perfect gaff shot in the head, in the head region. That way you don't disturb any of the, you know, the, you know, the perfect tuna loins or the fatty tuna belly, which is my favorite for a treat. Now let's talk about landing to release a school sized tuna like the ones we're getting today. So when the fish gets boat side, obviously I'll have a gloved hand. I'll take a couple turns on the 200 pound test leader that comes in the bar. Now this is just one single hook, so it's a perfect setup to swim the fish alongside in, you know, with the boat in sort of idle gear. And we're gonna let some water uh, flush through the tuna's gills while it sort of recalibrates its system, maybe lowers its lactic acid um, and its muscles. But anyway, you'll know it's time to release the fish when it starts getting hard to handle. That's when I take out my D-hooker, boom, pop, the fish is off, takes off, healthy release, and you're right back at it. 